Hi! Welcome to Pollen Morphology Training Part 3, Morphological Types. Let's talk about morphological types. In this presentation, we will try to answer the following questions. How do you properly identify morphological types? And what are the different morphological types? The morphological type of a grain is determined by the number of apertures present on that grain. Let's look at the Z-Stack videos below for an example. The pollen grains shown have three colpi and three pores. Each colpori is considered to be one aperture, therefore its morphological type is considered to be tricolporate. Most pollen grains are symmetrical, although this is not always the case. The presence of symmetry can be a helpful tool for determining a grain's morphological type. Z-Stack videos can allow the user to view a pollen grain in multiple planes of focus to help determine whether or not symmetry is present. These videos can also help the user determine the morphological type of a grain by showing any indication of apertures that may be hidden on the back of the grain. You may need to observe multiple views before the morphological type can be confirmed. Examining both polar and equatorial orientations can help the user visualize the grain in its three-dimensional form. This will allow the user to infer the number of apertures present even if they are not always visible. Take a moment to look at this image of a grain in its equatorial orientation. How many apertures do you see? Now watch the Z-Stack video. This video shows that there are two apertures present on the front of the grain, as well as two apertures present on the back of the grain. With the help of this video, we can determine that the morphological type for this grain is 4-colporate. Remember, by observing grains in both the polar and equatorial orientations, the user will gain a better understanding of what they are seeing and therefore be better equipped to classify a grain's morphological type. Here are a few things to keep in mind. Be sure to pay close attention when you are observing a grain. The apertures on the front and back of the grain may align perfectly, making it difficult to distinguish as focusing through the various planes. If this occurs, a polar view can be very helpful in establishing an accurate aperture count. Now we are about to show you some cartoon representations of the various morphological types. Here are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, all of the apertures shown in the cartoons will not be visible in a single plane of focus. Number two, the bold apertures shown are present in the upper planes of focus. Number three, the faded apertures shown enclosed by the dashed lines represent apertures present on the lower planes of focus. Now let's take a look at the various morphological types for porate grains. As you can see in the cartoon shown, in most cases, the number of pores present is implied by the name. For example, monoporate grains have a single pore, whereas triporate grains have three pores. The prefix Stefano applies to grains where the apertures are situated around the equator. For our purposes, we generally apply this term to grains that have six or more apertures. The prefix peri applies to apertures that are randomly distributed over the surface of a grain. Most peri aperturate grains have six or more apertures. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of the porate morphological types.
Now let's take a look at the various morphological types for colpate grains. As with the porate morphological types, the number of colpi present is implied by the name. For example, dicolpate grains have two colpi present. Once again, the prefix Stefano applies to apertures being situated around the equator, while the prefix Peri applies to apertures that are randomly distributed over the surface of the grain. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of the colpate morphological types. Now let's take a look at the various morphological types for colporate grains. The naming convention remains the same as with the porate and colpate morphological types. Remember, each colporate is considered to be a single aperture. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of the colporate morphological types. other morphological types. In addition to the morphological categories of porate, colpate, and colporate, there are also some other unique morphological types. Spira aperturate refers to a pollen grain with one or more apertures that is spiral in shape. Papillate refers to a small protrusion on the surface of the grain. Syncolpate or syncolporate refers to colpate or colporate grains that have colpi fused together at one or both poles. Trichotomosulcate refers to a grain with a three-armed aperture situated at one pole. Colpomultiporate refers to a grain that has two or more pores associated with a single colpus. And finally, an aperturate refers to a grain with no apertures. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of these unique morphological types. Here are some more unique morphological types. Parasyncolpate and parasyncolporate refers to colpate or colporate grains where the colpi are split and attached to the adjacent colpi, creating a triangular shape at the pole. Fenestrate, also referred to as lophate, refers to grains that have large window-like areas covering its surface. Pseudocolpus refers to a colpus-like pseudoaperture that is present in heteroapetrate pollen grains, and it is assumed to be non-functional. Heteroaperturate refers to grains with two different types of apertures present on the grain. The term typically applies to pollen grains with alternating colpi and colpori, although the term could also be used to describe a grain that has two different types of colpi or alternating pores and colpi. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of these unique morphological types.
The final morphological type that we will discuss today is saccade. This category can then be further classified as monosaccate, bisaccate, or trisaccate. Now take a moment to look at an example for each of the categories of saccate. Join us next time for part four, surface patterns, for more information. This concludes part three of our pollen morphology training series.